diversity. For example, humans. Oh, why can I go? Okay. So in terms of their complexity, for example, in this slide here, uh, you can see right on the top are prokaryotes. So bacteria are right here on the top. Um, and uh, other genomes. So from there, we actually move into uh, eukaryotes. These are prokaryotes. Eukaryotes start from there. And we are here at the bottom. Humans. Humans have about 3.2 uh, 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA. Um, also, you can also write them like this: mega base pairs, uh, or 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA. But if you look at some of the other organisms, salamander, for example, or lily. Uh, very small organisms. Salamander is very small organism, nothing compared with humans, size or complexity of its uh, physiology and anything like that. Lily is a plant, but their genome size is much bigger, actually several order of magnitude different than the humans. Uh, so they are smaller, less complex and all that, but they are much more complex. They are, in terms of the genome, they are much more complex than humans. What is the reason for that? The reason is there is no correlation between the complexity of an organism and the size of their genome. Because whenever a genome has, you know, so whenever I say genome, um, it means uh, the entire, it actually could mean two things. It could mean entire, set of chromosomes, or it could also mean the haploid set of chromosomes, haploid, which is 23, 23 chromosomes only. So over genome is the 23 chromosomes, haploid set of our, chromos of our chromosomes, not 46. So it is, it is much bigger. Um, and so the genome size really does not have any correlation um, with the complexity of the organism. Whenever the size is bigger, the bigger size in this case would mean that there is a lot more uh, non-coding DNA. This DNA used to be called as junk DNA. But that term is not used anymore because scientists have found that that non-coding DNA, repetitive DNA, has a lot of useful things in it. But the size is indicates that there is more accumulation of that type of DNA that we really did not understand a whole lot about to start with. And now more information is coming related to those those part of the DNA, which do not take part in the coding. They do not make any type of proteins. So that's um, that is good. Now, the in case of the human genes, in case of the eukaryotic genes, the gene itself. So the gene would mean sequence of DNA that makes a functional product. So what would be a functional product? Does anybody know what is a functional product? Like a protein? Yeah. So what else? Protein is one. What is another functional product? Not a, a protein. That would be RNA molecule. So some genes, which are the sequences of DNA, they do not make a product. They, they make RNA through transcription because the genes, they express themselves in the two-step process. They make RNA first, and then the second step is to make protein from it. So you said that protein is a functional product. Absolutely right. That's the ultimate goal of many of the genes to make a functional product so that they can take part in some type of a function. You know, they could be part of the cell, they could be a transport protein, or they could be a channel protein, or they could be a you know, um, you know, um, structural protein. 
cytoskeleton protein, something like that. But in other cases, the second step does not take place where RNA, messenger RNA is converted into protein. So they also are considered as genes. Genes, in case of eukaryotes, consist of mainly two parts. They, uh, at the DNA level, we are talking about the DNA level. So they have exons and introns. Exons are those uh, part of the gene that code for something. And introns are that part of the DNA, which is the non-coding part of the DNA. Those are interrupting sequences. They, they, are, they interfere with the gene. They split the gene um, uh, with those, those parts which do not make any functional product. Uh, so those, and so this is uh, that, that gene that has two introns and it has three exons. After the transcription, uh, transcription will make a messenger RNA and transcription takes place in two steps. First, it transcribes, it kind of makes a copy of the DNA in the form of RNA, which is called transcription. So uh, a primary transcript is made, which is unedited, which, is, which contains some of the sequences which are not necessary for protein translation. So intron, introns are those type of sequences that interrupt the gene, but they do not take part in the formation of the protein. Then a splicing even takes place that removes those introns and joins the axons together. That step is called splicing. So gene is spliced to remove introns from it to make a very compact type of a structure which is messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA in the second step will go through translation to make proteins from it. A protein or multiple proteins can be made from it as well. So now this step uh, describes the structure of the gene, which is, uh, which is comprised of axons and introns. Introns do not take part um, in the formation of the protein. Okay, that's generally true. How did they find out what those interrupting genes are, what those interrupting part of the genes in case of eukaryotes are? So they are very abundant in case of eukaryotes and they are seldomly found in case of prokaryotes. Prokaryotes messenger RNAs definitely do not have any introns in them. Uh, but in other types of uh, RNA, they do have some spacers or some sequences in between. Messenger RNAs in case of prokaryotes do not contain introns, and eukaryotes, almost all of them, have introns in them. So that's one distinction between prokaryotes and eukaryotes of their messenger RNA. The way they figured that out was with the help of this type of an analysis that was done by two you know, brilliant scientists back in 1980s, and those were Philip Sharp and Rich Roberts. Um, they published a paper back in 19, when was that published? Uh, let me see if I can find it. I think it was done in 1977. In 1977, they, what they did was, uh, they, they, they took RNA that was made from a gene, and then they hybridized it against DNA. And when they did that, they were surprised to see that um, in their uh, hybrids, in their hybrid that they were trying to find under electron microscope, they saw that some areas of um, RNA and DNA did not match, even though that RNA came from the DNA, from the same, uh, from the same DNA, but it really did not completely match with RNA. So RNA was smaller than the DNA. Um, the gene that, that you know, they were considering uh, was a hexon gene, and that gene, um, it was a viral gene, adenovirus gene. Um, so even in viruses have these introns. So, you know, that's why actually, 
Oh, OK, I'm not going to talk about that. I will just kind of start to go away from the topic. So um, that gene from a virus at the DNA level was bigger than the RNA that was produced from it. And when they analyzed it further, they found out that it was the RNA uh, which was smaller and DNA was longer. Um, and with further analysis, they were able to find out that there were several regions you know, that are shown here uh, in, in kind of a brown color, number one, two, one, two, and three. Those were the, the part that did not match with RNA, that did not match with RNA. This one, this one, and this one. Um, and the rest of this was almost entirely, completely matched with um, with RNA. So that RNA DNA uh, kind of a hybrid that was formed was uh, the, the basis of finding out, you know, the difference between RNA and DNA and axons and introns were discovered at that time. Okay. So, and then there are other regions at the DNA too. So if I want to actually draw um, a, a gene at the DNA level, it will look something like that. All right, so these, these areas are axons, axon one, Axon two, axon three, and this is intron one and intron number two. Then, other than these that we, we saw in the previous slides, then there are other regions which are called as UTRs, five prime and three prime UTR. Those are untranslated regions untranslated regions on both ends of DNA. Um, and even they are found when messenger RNA is produced. So when a messenger RNA is produced, which is smaller than the DNA, um, it has axon one, axon one, two, and three, and then it also has those UTRs, five prime UTR and three prime UTR is still there. These untranslated, meaning that they do not take part in the formation of protein, but they are there to protect the ends of messenger RNA, because the ends are important. They are part of the, uh, the translation that is done from them. So any damage to that um, after a certain number of sequences could be detrimental to the formation of the protein. So those sequences are there to protect the ends. All right, so that's the kind of a complete structure of a eukaryotic like, uh, like gene. When they analyzed you know, many genes in case of humans, they found out the number, average number of exons was 10. So we have you know, many genes. We have more than 20,000 genes. So when they analyzed those genes, they found out that uh, you know, on an average, each gene has about 10 exons. Um, and the length of uh, those exons um, could be what 43 could be 43 base pairs of DNA. And out of those 4,300 base pairs of DNA, about less than half of those would be the one that will make protein. Meaning that there are sequences on both ends of that messenger RNA that does not take part in the formation of protein. And surprising thing is, the length of those introns. If the length of an axon on average is 4,300 base pairs, then the collective length of an intron or all the introns in, an, uh, in a gene were 52,000 base pairs. 
So almost 10 times more than the length of all the exons within the gene. So meaning that um, that kind of uh, describes the enormity of the genes found in case of eukaryotes, and most of that is the intronic sequences, non-coding, you know, there's a non-coding type of DNA. That's why the genomes are so big. That, you know, it, you know uh, the amount of uh, the non-coding DNA is about 97%, or actually more than 97% in case of humans. It's about 98 point some percent. And only less than 1.9% is coding. So that clearly shows the, this difference, this distance, this difference between axons and introns, even within one gene, on an average, there's about 10 times you know, more intronic sequences than uh, axon sequences in them. All right, so you know that is the, the the kind of one of the reasons that there is so much DNA which does not code for protein because there is large accumulation of the DNA that is non-coding DNA. Uh, this table shows the differences of many different types of organisms. Humans are at the bottom. Uh, bacteria are on the top. Some bacteria are very small, only 4.6 million base pairs of DNA, whereas humans have 32. Hundred millions, million of millions of base pairs of DNA, 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA. Number of genes, we are not the ones that have the highest number of genes also. So if bacteria have about 4,200 genes, we have only about 20 to 21,000 genes. Arabidopsis, that is a small model plant, um, has more genes as compared to humans. Uh, so it is only about, you know, eight to 10 inches tall plant. Uh, then C. elegans, nematodes, they are much smaller. They are almost, uh, you know, microscopic. You know, they are about one millimeter in size. Um, actually, they are microscopic, not, you know, almost, but they are microscopic. Um, they have their entire body consists of uh, only about less than uh, 1,000 cells but they still have about 19,000 genes in them. Small thing, you know, compared with human body, they are probably like a million times smaller as compared to humans, but the number of gene wise, they are not that different than humans. Um, then other examples are there as well. In case of uh, uh, yeast, Baker's yeast, they have 6,000 genes. They are single cell organism. Um, they are eukaryotes. So, uh, but then I look at the number of introns per genes. In case of uh, bacteria, non-significant, uh, almost non-existent. And in case of humans, we have about uh, nine introns per gene. And 35% 35, 35 of the DNA is introns themselves, nothing else. So that's that's where the, the difference is. That's that explains the kind of complexity. Oh, this image was supposed to be like three slides before. This is the the electron micrograph of uh, Philip Sharp and Rich Roberts experiment in which they were trying to hybridize uh, RNA to the DNA where it came from, and they were able to see that this is actually the micrograph. And this is just the drawing of the same thing to explain what's going on. So they were able to actually see that where it kind of uh, hybridized perfectly uh, was in this part up to here. And all the other ones are the loops that come from here. So what it is is that you know this RNA. Um, which is in the middle uh, is a perfect match and wherever the introns are since uh, RNA molecule RNA RNAs do not have intron in them so it makes a loop uh, in that part so it hybridizes before and after that but wherever the intron is 
it just kind of loops out and does not uh, hybridize with DNA. OK, now, uh, so this information is uh, relatively new. This information was related to the uh, the lack of uh, uh, exons in the intronic areas. So the gene used to be that there is intron, uh, there is exon, exon split by the introns in the middle, and there, wherever the introns are or were, there are no other genes located there. And in case of humans, it was very well known that genes are located only on the one side, on the one uh, of the two fragments of DNA. So either they are present here or they are present on the opposite side. Um, but they are not present at the same time on both strands of DNA. Uh, they, the scientists have found out after the completion of the human genome uh, that there are at least one example in which the gene is located uh, on the second strand of DNA, uh, on the second strand of DNA or the opposite DNA in the intron area. So, like here, this is an intron, and you know this gene was not supposed to be here. This gene which is called the nested gene now. Uh, and if, you know, another thing that we need to remember is the orientation of the DNA. Uh, genes are located on this fragment of DNA or this, you know, this strand of DNA going from five prime towards three prime. That's how the DNA sequences are. They go from five prime towards three prime. Genes go from five prime towards three prime uh, of the DNA as well. And on the opposite strand in the intron is this gene, which is going in the opposite direction. This gene is going in this direction, and in the intron are these two exons, which are separated by an intron, um, going in the opposite direction. So when the, when the transcription takes place, it will make one transcript, primary transcript from here, and it will make the second transcript from the nested gene. And Simultaneously, they will be translated. They will make, you know, kind of a different type of protein. This will make bigger protein, and the other one will make a smaller protein. This is kind of a surprise thing. It was known in case of viruses, but it was not known in case of in case of uh, eukaryotes. So now we cannot say that. So there is a hope. Um, the reason actually they have given this example is to make a point. The point was that uh, you know, when, when I was a student at that time, we learned that introns and other sequences like that are part of the junk DNA, that you know, those don't make any proteins, and that's why they call them junk. Because, but now we don't call them junk because we don't know the purpose of introns. Uh, more genes are being found in the introns now than before. And they are also finding out that introns are essential for the functioning of a gene. If introns are not there, splicing of the intron, splicing, if they are not there, then the function of the gene sometimes is disrupted. Uh, and then introns also enhance the number of proteins that can be formed from the same gene. So they are finding more and more applications, more and more uses of the intron sequences, and that's why we don't really hear this word of junk DNA anymore. So all DNA is, is useful. We just don't understand it at this point. Another thing is, um, which uses the introns is called alternative splicing. Alternative splicing is when the primary transcript makes multiple types of messenger RNA molecules, that process is called as alternative splicing. So it means that multiple type of proteins can be produced from a single gene at the DNA level. Just remember uh, the whole process. The whole process is to make RNA, and that RNA gets 
translated into protein. When multiple types of RNA molecules can be produced from a single gene to make multiple types of proteins, that process is called alternative splicing. And alternative splicing involves the joining of exons in different combinations, more than one combination. So this example shows it quite clearly that this gene has you know, six different exons and it has five different introns that are interrupting those exons. At the time of primary transcript formation, the entire length is, uh, is copied in the form of RNA. And when the second step comes, different pathways are followed to make multiple proteins from it. You know, the first one that makes protein number one, in this case here, exon number three is missing. So it's not there. One, two, four, five, six, meaning that it skips number three, just to kind of uh, give you an example. Another one is where two and four are missing. So there is no two and four here. Then in the last one, only two is missing and everything else is there. So um, this is a one way of uh, increasing the number of proteins that can be formed from a single gene. Isn't that neat? That is really neat. Now, since we say that we have only 20,000 genes, or 21,000 genes, uh, but the number of proteins that are found in case of human cells is more than 100,000 different proteins. So, and that used to be the dilemma. That's why actually people used to say that the number of genes in case of humans varies somewhere between 80 to 100,000 because the number of proteins are around the same number. Um, but, but we know that you know, that's not the case. After the DNA was sequenced, so they found out, they figured it out quite well, that that number is not 80 or 100,000. The number of genes in case of humans is about 20,000 genes. And uh, uh, the reason actually we still keep on seeing different numbers, somewhere you will see 20, somewhere you will see 21, somewhere you will see 22. The, the problem is we really don't know exactly how many number of genes that we have. Even after the completion of the human genome sequencing project, because the definition of gene is a sequence of DNA that makes a functional product, but in many cases, we don't know what those functional products are. At the DNA level, there is a structure of the gene but we don't know what type of proteins or what type of RNA molecules are produced from them. So till we figure this out, you will keep on seeing the numbers vary quite a bit, somewhere between. Now, most of the books actually not go beyond 20 to 22,000 genes, but that number used to be much bigger. You know, it used to start with 100,000, came down to 50,000 to 25,000, now it is somewhere between 20 and 22,000 genes. So it is, it is pretty interesting. Um, and the interesting thing is that the smaller number of genes can make many, many more number of proteins from them. So it is pretty, uh, you know, it is pretty smart system that instead of having more genes to make it more bulky and bigger genome at the DNA level, that creates some problems at the time of cell division. So why not use them more smartly? Instead of having more genes, you know, make more proteins from the same smaller number of genes. And the way to do that is alternative splicing. Professor, quick. Um, yes, sir. What dictates, has they, I don't know if they found out what dictates this. Is this just a random occurrence during translation? And and then they're like, OK, well, this protein's being made now. Well, no, it's not really random. Uh, it is it, it is a highly organized system. Um, so alternative splicing is done in two different ways. One is done based on the developmental stage. So for example, from the same gene, 
a protein is made, which is different. Um, you know, when it is when we are in the zygotic stage, uh, when we are say in the fetal stage, it may be different type of protein is produced. Uh, and when we become uh, older, uh, a different type of protein is produced from the same gene. So because the, the body needs different type of protein uh, based on the developmental stage. Um, another one is uh, kind of a differentially expressed based on based on the conditions, based on the environment. Um, meaning that in uh, from the same gene, since we all the cells of our body have all have the DNA, which is the same DNA, have the same number of genes in all the cells of our body. But what is produced is different. What is produced in our brain, uh, which you know, in the brain cells, in the neurons, is different than what is produced in our heart, what is produced in our liver or in our kidneys or even intestines from the same set. And uh, when it is expressed differentially from the same gene, it may produce a different protein in our um, intestine as compared to, you know, in one of our glands. And there are actually many examples that are given in that, in that respect to show the difference from the same gene, slightly different variation, slightly different combination of axons produces a completely different type of a protein or a different type of a hormone. So it is an organized structure which is controlled by the development uh, because the need at different stages of our development are different uh, or in order to kind of um, uh, have a uh, kind of a different, in order to kind of deal with different situations at different times, different types of proteins are needed. So that can be done by changing the combination of axons. So it's a very modular system. You can actually take one and combine it with three, four, and five, or you can take two and combine it with you know some other combination and make a completely different type of a, a protein. So, but it is it is a controlled process.